got 18 inches of snow yesterday. <laughs> Welcome to March in Vermont. Uh, if you look up here, just uh, at the edge of this road, there's a stone wall under that snow. It's sticking out, they're sticking out here and there. Um, and you can probably see that it's a, quite a raised ridge running along the edge of the road. See, the backside is lower. So this is a stone wall here right along this road. All right. Can you see the stone wall? Barely. <laughs> just sort of looks there's like... There's so much snow, yeah. <laughs> there's so much snow. just looks like a snow snake <laughs> made out of, I don't know, rock. Yep. <laughs> but I've, I mean, I've seen so many. I know exactly what it looks like under there. <laughs> exactly, right? Right? Yeah. You've probably seen stone walls like this, too. They're all over Vermont. Some of them are really high and thick, and some of them are wide or really narrow. This is Malcolm Moore, Wyndham County resident and retired land surveyor. They go around fields or through fields and along roads. They go over hilltops and across swamps. They go over bedrock and along agricultural fields. They're everywhere. Malcolm is one of our question askers. Question askers, plural, because he didn't submit this question alone. It was actually both our questions. This is Jack Widness, a retired academic pediatrician who also lives in Wyndham County. Two question askers is unusual. I didn't realize there were two inquisitive minds at work until we all got on a call together. You know, you can't send an email from two people, so <laughs> I had to do it. But Malcolm really was uh, an equal uh, on this. A few years ago, Jack and Malcolm were part of a crew clearing trails on Hogback Mountain in Marlboro. And you'll never guess what they found. So there are these stone walls that were all over the place, you know, going up at steep ankles, very close to the tops of the mountain. What in the world was in the mind of these people? The two of them started talking about it and realized that while they knew a fair amount about stone walls, neither of them had the answers they were looking for. So anyhow, that's that's you know, where we got together, sort of scratched our heads, and we thought about Brave Little State. From Vermont Public, this is Brave Little State, a show where we answer questions about Vermont that have been asked and voted on by you, our audience. We do it this way because we think our journalism is better when you're a part of it. I'm Angela Evansy. Today on the show, reporter Anna Van Dyne takes on a question from Jack Widness of Wilmington and Malcolm Moore of Marlboro. For what purpose did our Vermont forebearers do all the hard work of building stone walls in such different and unusual locations? These old walls really are all over the place. There's a sort of like, why is this here? So how did they come to be? And what do they tell us about the history of this region? So it was complicated from the moment that pigs and settlers stepped off those ships. And what is it about stone walls anyway? Nostalgia is a thing that we do for ourselves. It has little or nothing to do with the people who created the original work that is causing us to be nostalgic. Brave Little State is a proud member of the NPR Network. Welcome. Support for Brave Little State comes from Horsford Nursery Charlotte, partnering with Vermont schools to plant Arbor Day trees for 30 years. Native trees for your spring plantings are available at the nursery and online. Opening day is April 15th. Complete plant catalog and pricing at horsefordnursery.com. And Windows and Doors by Brownell, supporting new build and replacement projects with high-quality Marvin solutions. As an employee-owned company, they value customer relationships and believe that quality products create happier, healthier spaces in your home. Be inspired with Marvin at Windows and Doors by Brownell, wdbrownell.com. Question asker Malcolm has encountered a lot of stone walls over the years, and he's always wondered about them. And if you ask somebody, they immediately dismiss it as with some easy answer, like, oh, they're there to mark your boundaries or something like that. And I go, no, I don't think so. 
Not that mm. simple. Malcolm has also heard simple answers about things like livestock fencing and crop fields. And his real hang-up is that it seems like a lot of work to build stone walls for those things. Like, too much work to make sense. When we announced this winning question, a lot of you were like, come on, it's totally because of sheep. But is it really? Or is there more to the story? Maybe Malcolm has thought about this a little bit more than the average person, but none of the simple answers has satisfied his nagging curiosity. I suspect there's some validity to all of those all of those explanations, but to me it remains just a, a question, a fascinating question. Why were they built? What Malcolm and Jack are looking for isn't a simple answer about stone walls, but a story about stone walls, and the stories in stone walls. One of my interests in, in stone walls, other than on steep hills and whatnot, is what they tell us historically about the way people lived. You know, after you know, 10 or 15 years, culture changes. Jack and Malcolm submitted their question after spending some time in the woods. So that's where I went to find an answer. Where are we right now? We are in at the edge of the Heinsberg Town Forest on the west side, Hayden Hill Road West. This is Jane Dorney. She's a geographer. Her work focuses on the evolution of the Vermont landscape. And she's a bit of a stone wall expert. <laughs> <laughs> I studied stone walls in depth, yes. I'm also here with Alicia Daniel, who runs the Vermont Master Naturalist Program. And we look at landscapes like you're slicing through them like the layers of the cake. We start with the geology and talk about the glacial history. And where Jane and I intersect is around uh, the settlement, European settlement history layer, which is pretty far up the cake. We'll come back to that cake later. For now, we're snowshoeing through the 18 inches of snow that was sprinkled on top of it like a thick layer of powdered sugar. We're tramping down an abandoned road in the town forest, with a 200-year-old stone wall running along one side. Alicia and Jane are the kinds of people who have deep connections to the natural landscape. It's people, it's past, and it's present. They're seasoned teachers, practical dressers, patient explainers, and careful observers. So the stone wall, to really understand stone walls... It helps to understand sort of the context in which they were made. They were made by farmers, farm families. Um, And so they're always associated with other farm features, 19th century farm features. So when I'm looking at stone walls, it's always a pattern. And if you know what to look for, you can usually tease it out. Jane pauses to point out three big maple trees with low branches and trunks so large it would take two people to wrap their arms around them. If you look around, you know, the size of the yes of the trunk is significantly larger than yeah. anything else yeah. anywhere nearby. And we are standing on the road. These guys are in a line. Right. <laughs> There's stone and, walls nearby. And because of the lower branches, we know they were open grown. And they were open grown. So when they were yeah. growing, yes. it, was, it was open here, not yes. all woods like it is now. Right. So let's see what goes with it. Jane knows exactly what goes with it. She's studied this place extensively. We take a turn off the road and into the trees and stop again, this time in front of a big rectangular hole. This is a cellar hole for the farmhouse. The big maple trees are planted in the front yard, in the open, and the stone walls are part of the field system of the farm. So all of the sort of piece, there's a pattern, and the pieces are here, if you know how to look at them and sort of connect them in your head. Jane says it can feel like going back in time. The story of Vermont's stone walls is about much more than just people making something. It's about the most enduring parts of this landscape and how humans have interacted with them. In other words, the story of stone walls is not so much a story of the people who built them. It's a small chapter in the story of the stones themselves. So we're going to start pretty far back. That cake Alicia mentioned comes in useful here. Each stage of history is a new layer. 
The bottom layer of the cake is geologic. The bedrock of Vermont is mostly made of schists, limestones, slates, shales, and sandstones that formed over the course of hundreds of millions of years. The next layer is glacial. There have been several advances of ice over the Vermont landscape, but let's just talk about the last one. Uh, Ice built up in Canada, and it got so heavy and big, the piles and piles of snow and the ice beneath it began to flow across the landscape. So if Jane, Alicia, and I were standing in this exact same spot about 20,000 years ago, we would also be standing in the cold, not on 18 inches of snow, but on top of a layer of ice more than a mile thick. As the ice flowed across the landscape, it plucked and dragged and moved stones around. Then, about 18,000 years ago, that ice slowly started to melt. Then, as it began to melt back, it wasn't clawing things back. It didn't claw rocks from Connecticut up into Vermont. It was dropping things. By about 13,000 years ago, the glacier was gone, which brings us to the next layer of the cake. The whole 13,000 or so year history of Abenaki presence on this landscape through today. Alicia says humans moved into the area as the glacier receded and have been here for hundreds of generations. About a thousand years ago, they were spending a lot of time in the river valleys and traveled extensively by boat. They moved seasonally. There was some agriculture and fishing along the rivers and some hunting in the woods. Indigenous peoples in the Northeast and beyond did, by the way, build things with stone, but not the walls we're talking about here. For the most part, the stones left behind by the glacier sat pretty much untouched for more than 10,000 years. Soil covered them, trees grew over them. If we were standing in this same spot in Heinsberg a thousand years ago, it would be a very different forest. I imagine we would here and most places in Vermont be surrounded by really large trees. And the forest, the floor would be spongy, there'd be a lot of duff and um, the soil would not have been compacted and eroded. So it's just mossy and messy and deadfall. What changed all that was the next and final layer of the cake, European colonization. Europeans first showed up here in the 17th century. They displaced and decimated the people who'd been living in the region for thousands of years, profoundly altering their ways of life. Colonists brought domesticated animals, farming practices, and the concept of property, and permanently altered the landscape. In the 18th century, surveyors came through and divided up the land. Some early settlers chose lots in higher elevations. Even though some of the hills were steep, they thought the soil there was best for farming, and the growing season was longer than in the river valleys. Jane says that's why question askers Malcolm and Jack found stone walls while clearing trails up on Hogback Mountain. It wasn't random. You're going to put all that energy into a random spot and just see if it worked? No, absolutely not. When they found their lot, they usually cut a small clearing near the middle. If we were standing in this same place in Heinsberg just over 200 years ago, we'd be in that clearing. There would be a little log cabin and maybe a lean-to for the animals. As soon as they could, the settlers would have dug that cellar hole and built a house. When they looked out the front window here in Heinsberg, they would have seen those three maple trees. But you could also keep an eye on anybody who was coming down the road. (laughs) And the neighbors. Um, This is also the road the kids would walk to school on. The one-room schoolhouse was just down the road. There would have been a barn nearby and the crop fields. And the stone walls go around those crop fields. Now, finally, we get to the stone walls. At first, the colonists built fences out of wood and stumps. But when farmers went to plow their fields, they discovered those stones that the glaciers had left behind thousands of years before. Hence, the walls. 
As a side note, you won't find stone walls in the Champlain Valley because a lake formed there as the glacier receded and any stones left behind were covered by clay. But everywhere else, farmers found lots of stones in their way. To run your plow through there, you would have to move those stones. Um, they had stone boats, they called them. They were um, sort of wooden sleds, I guess, maybe is sort of the best name for them. Um, so they'd go through the field and pick the stones that were on they could see. Um, they put them on the sleds, the stone, the stone boats, and then take them to the edge of the field. I mean, they, that, the, one of, some of the heaviest work was actually getting the stones out of the field, really, actually. This had to be done every year. Each spring, the frost heaves would bring up a new crop of stones, and they'd take them out of the field. They would stack the stones along, if there was a wooden fence there, they would stack, the, just throw the stones along the wooden fence. I read a lot of descriptions in farm diaries of that from that era. Um, until you could accumulate enough that you could make a good section of wall. These were wall-building people. If you've ever seen the stone walls in places like England and Ireland, you know what I'm talking about. So they took these stones and turned them from an inconvenience into something useful. A wall that would last a long time, didn't take much work to maintain, and kept livestock out of the crops. Most people think the stone walls and think of them like fences now where you're fencing animals in. But most, not every single one, but most of the stone walls were built to fence animals out The farmers usually started their walls near the house and the barn and worked their way out to the fields, where they grew wheat and oats and rye and barley and potatoes and corn and maybe an apple tree or two. They had more cows by then, and horses and chickens and pigs. In the 1830s and 40s, the landscape was dotted with about 1.7 million sheep during the Merino sheep boom. This is quite a significant story, so more on that in a future episode maybe. But I do want to talk about sheep for a minute. Like I mentioned earlier, when we announced this winning question about stone walls, a lot of you responded to say they were built because of sheep. I consulted with a number of reputable sources on this, and while it's true that sheep contributed to the walls, there are somewhat conflicting accounts as to how. Some say that because of how much land was clear-cut for sheep pasture, there was a shortage of wood and farmers turned to stone fencing more quickly. Others say the combination of deforestation and a ton of sheep grazing on the landscape caused erosion that dislodged more stones. Jane says her research into primary documents showed that the extra income from wool helped farmers expand their infrastructure. That means building more barns, hiring help, and building more sections of wall. Anyway, around the 1850s, the sheep boom became a bust. And before long, farmers switched to dairy. If Jane, Alicia, and I were standing in the same spot in Heinsberg in 1869, we would be standing in a big clearing on a farm belonging to the Fraser family. So this would have been near the maximum of clearing for the whole state of Vermont, that era. So they'd have maybe 20 acres in grain and, and, uh, and such. They were still growing a lot of grain. By this time, the landscape had been radically transformed. Between the sheep farming and logging, Vermont had become about 70 percent deforested by the late 19th century. For comparison, it's the opposite now. The modern landscape is just 30 percent clear. So you would have been looking out at those fields, those grains waving in the breeze, you know, and in the summertime. Maybe your 10, 12 cows um, out beyond the crop fields. And then your, your woodlot would be farther out. Very, very agricultural compared to, look, this forest we're standing in right now, right? Right? Yeah. Incredible. Over the past century and a half, agricultural practices changed. Technology advanced. People moved into the valleys or out west. Trees grew back. We make our way back through the woods, leaving the cellar hole, the maple trees, and the past behind. Alicia and Jane take a seat on a snowbank, and we look over at the stone wall. Even though the farmhouse has disappeared and the fields have turned back into forest, the wall remains completely out of context. And so that, that there's a sort of like, why is this here? 
And so it catches people's attention because of that. And as we've been doing today, you know, when you then just look at that one feature and then try to understand the context it came out of, um, it does take you back to a different time when things worked very differently. No, very differently. When we come back, why we shouldn't get too nostalgic about these walls. That's right after this on Brave Little State. Thanks for listening to Brave Little State, where we have support from SRH Law, formerly Dunkiel Saunders, a law firm with a mission dedicated to helping clients create a positive, lasting impact by focusing on three key areas, securing our energy future, transforming communities, and advancing a values-led economy. Learn about local and global projects at srhlaw.com. Making a difference is their practice. Maybe you have a stone wall in your life. The one I always think of is a wall down the road from where I grew up. Every summer, there are these roses that appear all along it. And when I see them, these unlikely blushes of pink, I think about someone planting them long ago. Someone who remembered that in the midst of hard work and practicality, we still need something beautiful. When you come across an old stone wall, you're confronted with the fact that someone must have put it there, even if it's on a steep hillside or in the middle of the woods. So many places you walk in the wild and you're excited to be somewhere where nobody else may have walked. But here it's the excitement. Oh, you know, here are these walls. This is where something happened here. Somebody put a tremendous amount of effort into this. Susan Allport wrote the book Sermons in Stone, The Stone Walls of New England and New York. While reporting this episode, I talked to a number of people like Susan who've done extensive research on stone walls in New England. I say New England because the story of stone walls isn't just a Vermont story. Glaciers didn't just cover this one state. They covered the whole region and dropped stones all over the place. So in addition to Vermont, you can find stone walls in New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Maine, New York. We've just heard the Vermont story, but it's bigger than that. It seems to be just the Yankee farmer and and his plow and the stones, but it wasn't that at all. It was much more interesting. The whole history of it is much more interesting. That whole idea that... Um, The colonists came, and because the Native Americans didn't have fencing, they then turned fencing into this unqualified good. Okay, well, we do fence, so therefore we're better. We enclose it, and therefore, you know, it's ours. So it was complicated from the moment that pigs and, and settlers stepped off those ships and came into this land where fencing hadn't been required and didn't exist. In some ways, stone walls serve as monuments to fundamentally different ideas about how human beings can relate to the landscape and each other. Like Susan said, it wasn't just the Yankee hill farmer turning up stones and bringing them to the edge of the field. It would have involved everyone on the farm. In some places, particularly on bigger farms in Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island, that included the forced labor of Native Americans, enslaved people, and indentured servants. At the same time, there were those who made a living as skilled wall builders. An example of this is Reverend George Brown, one of the first Black pastors to spend time in Vermont. Even though the people who built them are no longer here, the stone walls remain. And now here they are that we can do whatever we want. We can romanticize them or we can look at the full complexity of them. We obsess on on the part that, that is still around and we don't even see the part that's been long gone. Robert Thorson is a professor of earth sciences at the University of Connecticut. He's devoted his career to the study of stone walls. And he says their story is not only regional and complex, but it comes in two parts. The first half is mostly about human ecology. We've gone over that part, the way European settlers interacted with the stones on the landscape and stacked them into walls. And the second half is about 
uh, human architecture, reverence, interaction, nostalgia, if you like. Thorson says over time, walls have taken on a significance that has a lot more to do with culture than with nature. The people who built stone walls knew they would last, but they had no idea how much or how quickly things would change, that their fields would turn back into forests, that their old farms would become ruins. Now, what was once a convenient way to store stone and keep livestock out of crop fields has become a relic of an unreachable past. A stone wall today is a window into the bedrock beneath our feet and a reminder of the inevitability of time. Thorson says for him, stone walls inspire a sense of reverence, not for the people who built them, but for nature itself. There's a sense of nature claiming you know, or reclaiming the works of human beings spread all over the surface that allows us to see, to see us with more humility. Nostalgia is a thing that we do for ourselves. It has little or nothing to do with the people who created the original work that is causing us to be nostalgic. Kevin Gardner lives in New Hampshire. He is, among other things, a master stone wall builder. I think I can tell you with some certainty that the building of stone walls was hardly a nostalgic practice for those who actually did it. He says wall building involves a lot of time spent standing and staring, trying to figure out which stones to put where to make the wall as tight and firm as possible. But no matter how well you build a wall, it's constantly in a state of falling down, deteriorating too slowly for the eye to observe. Walls, uh, I like to joke, uh, are like people. They tend to loosen up and spread out as they get older. Uh, If you were, for instance, to take a 150-year time-lapse movie of a of the single surface of an old stone wall, you'd be amazed at the little tiny motions. Some people take care of the walls on their property and replace the stones that have tumbled or slid out of place. They're fighting against erosion, the expansion of tree roots, and the activity of small animals. There's also the occasional small earthquake, or flood, or big storm. And every year, there are frost heaves. Something there is that doesn't love a wall, that sends the frozen ground swell under it, and spills the upper boulders in the sun, so even two can pass abreast. This is Robert Frost reading his poem Mending Wall at the Breadloaf School of English in 1954. Frost wrote a lot of poems that include stone walls, but this is probably the most famous. It tells the story of two men walking along the wall that marks the border between their farms. They're repairing it, replacing stones that have been dislodged. We keep the wall between us as we work, to each the boulders that have fallen to each, And some are loaves, and some so nearly balls, we have to use a spell to make them balance. Stay where you are until our backs are turned. We wear our fingers rough with handling them. Oh, just another kind of outdoor game, one on the side. The narrator questions what they're doing, the traditions they're unthinkingly upholding. In his own way, Frost poses a very similar question to the one Jack and Malcolm asked— why do we have this wall? Isn't it where there are cows? But here there are no cows. Before I build a wall, I'd ask to know what I was walling in or walling out and to whom I was like to give offense. Something there is that doesn't love a wall, that wants it down. I the could... poem famously ends with the neighbor's simple rebuttal. Good fences make good neighbors. But the question still lingers. A question anyone might ask if they came across a line of stones in the woods, on a hillside, or along a road. What's the point of a wall? Anna Van Dyne. Thanks so much for listening to the show. And thanks to Jack Widness and Malcolm Moore for the great question. To see photos from Anna's reporting and find some reading recommendations on this topic, check out our website, bravelittlestate.org. While you're there, you can submit your own question about Vermont, sign up for the BLS newsletter, and vote on the question you want us to tackle next. Or call our BLS hotline and leave a message. That number is 802-552-4880. We're on Instagram and Reddit at BraveStateVT. 
This episode was reported and mixed by Anna Van Dyne. I produced it with scoring and sound design by Josh Crane. Additional production from Myra Flynn and May Nagusky. Editing by all of us. Ty Gibbons composed our theme music, other music by Blue Dot Sessions. Special thanks to Tom Wessels and to Rebecca Irwin at the Middlebury College Archives. Brave Little State is a production of Vermont Public and a proud member of the NPR Network. If you liked this episode, let us know at bravelittlestate.org slash donate, or just tell your friends to listen. I'm Angela Evansy. We'll be back soon with more people-powered Vermont journalism. Until then. Thank mm-hmm. you.